Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 17, The Rise of the Khazars and the Khazar Arab Wars. I'm recording this episode while I have COVID, so my apologies if I get a little hoarse in places. We left the Western Turk Kayanth at the end of the 6th century, about to sink, as steppe empires are wont to do, into a succession crisis. From this crisis, the Khazars would form one of the steppe's most enduring empires, ruling the Pontus and dominating the surrounding peoples for around 400 years. Khazars were extremely important to the history of the region, playing a key role in the ethnogenesis of numerous peoples surviving to this day, including the Hazaras, the Persian-speaking population of Afghanistan, Hungarians, Kazakhs, and the Cossacks of the Don and Ukraine. And yes, Kazakh and Cossack derive from the same root word. As well as some you might not have heard of, Krimchaks and Crimean Karaites, the former rabbinic Jews, the latter followers of their own unique version of Judaism, Kumiks, the main Turkic group in the North Caucasus, and the Moldavian Changos, not to mention the Rus and the Volga Bulgars. In 618, Tong Yagbu Kayan, a member of the Ashina clan, succeeded to the throne of the Western Chork. He maintained good relations with China's Tang dynasty, who seemed to have regarded his reign as the peak of Tyok power, and also with Byzantium. He sent his nephew, Bori Shad, to raid Sasanian Persia, and in 627-628 he may have joined the Emperor Heraclius in a campaign against the Persians, who were allied with the Tyork's steppe rivals, the Avars. I say may, because the Byzantine records refer to the leader of the Turk as Zebul. Some scholars believe that Zebul was actually Tong. Others argue that Zebul was his uncle, Sipikayan, whose name may have been pronounced in that way at the time. This campaign was the end of the Third Perso-Turkic War, and the culmination of over 600 years of war between Rome and the Persians. Initially, Byzantium was put on the back foot by the Avar-Persian alliance, which also included the Avar's Slav vassals. But the Turk, enemies of the Avars, not particularly friendly to the Persians, and keen to restore peace and keep the trade routes running smoothly, were the Byzantines' natural allies. Persia took Egypt and the Levant and laid siege to Constantinople. But the siege failed, and the initiative passed to the Byzantines. Unlike previous campaigns that had gone into Persia itself, this time the war concentrated on the Caucasus. In 627, the Turk took the fortress of Derbent on the Caspian, then part of Caucasian Albania, and now Russia's southernmost city in modern-day Dagestan. The Armenian chronicler, Movsis Kagan Kadvatsi, witnessed the sack of the city, and the Tyork clearly made a big impression on him. Describing them as hideously ugly, vile, broad-faced, without eyelashes, and with long flowing hair like women, he says that they were, quote, like ravening wolves without shame. They fell upon the inhabitants and mercilessly slaughtered them in the streets and squares of the city. They had no mercy for the beautiful or the handsome, for the young men or the women. They did spare the unfit, harmless, lame or old. They did not spare the unfit, harmless, lame or old. They had no compassion, and their hearts did not shrink at the sight of babies embracing their murdered mothers. End quote. The taking of the supposedly impregnable stronghold caused panic in Albania and the Turk moved on into Iberia, a forerunner of modern Georgia, to join up with Heraclius and lay siege to Tbilisi. 
Heraclius was so pleased to see Tom that he promised him the hand of his daughter, Eudoxia Epiphania. But the siege conditions did not suit the steppe warriors. So after a couple of months, some of them left, leaving Borishad in charge of the remaining troops. A while later, he also decided that they were not achieving much, and likewise departed. Left alone, Heraclius decided to abandon the siege and take the battle to the Persians. He took his army towards the ruins of Nineveh, the ancient capital of the Assyrians, trying to avoid the Persian army led by Rakhzad. As additional Persian reinforcements arrived to join the main army, Heraclius crossed the Tigris and acted as if he was trying to retreat, enticing them into battle on the ground that he had selected. He had chosen a plain that would suit Byzantine heavy cavalry and infantry more than the Persian archers. Byzantine chroniclers Nicephorus and Theophanes the Confessor state that Raxad challenged Heraclius to single combat, which Heraclius accepted and then slew him with a single blow. Raxad did indeed die in the battle, but we should not necessarily accept that this literary trope describes what actually happened. Regardless, the battle ended with the Persian army routed, half the troops destroyed, and a total Byzantine victory. A collapsed bridge prevented the Byzantines continuing to attack the Persian capital, Ctesiphon, but the Persian army had had enough. Rebelling, they killed Hosrael II and placed his son, Kavad II, on the throne. Kavad immediately opened peace negotiations. Heraclius was willing to offer terms, and the centuries of Roman-Persian wars finally ended in Roman victory. But this victory was to prove hollow. The years of fighting had exhausted both Byzantium and Persia, economically and militarily, leaving both empires depleted and vulnerable to the new threat that was appearing on the horizon, Islam. Meanwhile, back in Iberia, after hearing of Heraclius's victory, Tong returned to the siege of Tbilisi. The city was stormed and the Georgians surrendered. Tong continued attacks on Caucasian Albania and Armenia in order to cement his control over the Silk Road trade routes from China to Byzantium. But despite these apparent successes, as this campaign ended, Sipi, acting in the interests of the Dulo clan, murdered Tong and assumed the throne. Heraclius's daughter, the promised bride Eudoxia Epiphania, was already on her way to the wedding, but hearing of his death, she returned home. It was this murder of Tong that triggered the succession crisis, as Sippy was unable to persuade all the factions to support him. Compounding this, the Tang dynasty was moving into Central Asia, putting the Turk under pressure in the east. The result was a split into tribal confederations. In the centre of the empire, the on och ten arrows, two groups of five tribes each, simultaneously rivalled each other and continued to vie with the Tang. In 657, the Tang army, led by General Su Ding Fang, with two Ashina clan members on his side, reopened hostilities against the western Turk. Marching through snow, they took the Turk by surprise, killing or capturing tens of thousands. The Turk ruler, Ashina Helu, retreated to Tashkent, but the people of Tashkent had no wish to be sacked by the Tang, and taking him prisoner, they handed him over to the Chinese. With a couple more seasons of mop-up operations against Turk pretenders, the Gup Turk Empire was dead. In the west, beyond reach of the Chinese armies, two more tribal confederations appeared. One we have already looked at, the Bulgars under Kugrat, who came from the Dulo clan. The other was the Khazars, who retained Ashina leadership, possibly beginning with Bori Shad. 
over the period between 630 and around 670, Khazars conquered the Lower Volga and then subjugated the Onagurs and Bulgars in the Caspian region, while the other Bulgars, led by Asperuch, moved further west to found Danube, Bulgaria. Khazar Empire was one of the largest states in medieval Eurasia, extending from the North Caucasus to the Middle Volga, around where Tatarstan is today, and from the western parts of modern Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan across the Ukrainian steppe to Kiev. This Khazar Khayanet established control over trade along the Central Asian trade routes and the North-South trade connecting the Northern Forest Zone with Byzantium and the Caliphate, creating 200 years of the Pax Khazarica from about 700. Khazars followed the common Turkic practice of dual kingship, with a military leader called the Bek and a senior king with a primarily ceremonial and sacral role known as the Kayan. As with the Gokturk Ashimas, the coronation involved ritual strangulation, with Kayun de declaring how long he would reign. There were elaborate burial rituals at the death of the Kayun. A palace would be built and appropriately furnished, and then the Kayun and the servants accompanying him would be interred and a river redirected to flow over it. Hidden mausoleums were very typical of steppe rulers. The Kayanet was multi-ethnic, with sources giving between 25 and 40 subject peoples, Slavic, Iranic and Finno-Ugrian, as well as Turkic. We have contemporary records concerning the Khazars in Arabic, Hebrew, Syriac, Persian, Greek, Latin, Armenian, Georgian, Slavic and Chinese, but we cannot be sure what their own language was. Possibly, it was an Ugric Turkic language, from that branch of which Chuvash is the sole survivor, maybe even the same language as the Bulgars spoke. There are some finds of runic inscriptions similar to those used by Turkic peoples in Central Asia, but so far they cannot be deciphered. The origins of the Khazars also remain obscure. Scholars have put forward a number of theories. First, that they derive from the Agaziri, a Hunnic people referred to by Priscus and Jordanis. Or, they may have come from a union of the Uyghuric tribes, the Sabirs and the Turk. They were Turkicized Ugrians, descended from the Sabirs. Perhaps they were Uyghurs. Or they could have been Hephthalites in alliance with the Sabirs. There is little concrete data in favour of any one of these. But the fact that several sources report initiation ceremonies similar to those used by the Ashina might just tip the balance towards the Turk, Sabirs and Uyghuric tribes theory. The surviving Khazar words that we know, such as titles and personal and place names, are enough to know that they were Turkic speakers, but not to be more specific than that. They had some key differences from other steppe empires. The Kayans maintained a comitatus of warrior guards, the Arsia, but they were not Khazars. They are usually regarded as coming from Khwarazm, a region lying on the Amudarya Delta between the Aral Sea, Kuzulkum Desert, Karakum Desert and the Ustyuk Plateau, but they may rather have been Alans. Whatever the origin, they appear after a certain point to have been Muslims. They formed the core of a standing army of seven to 12,000 under direct central control. At need, the Kayans could also call up to 100,000 warriors from their subject nobles. In contrast to other steppe empires that were highly dependent on trade for essential as well as luxury goods, Khazars established a domestic economy combining traditional steppe pastoralism and agriculture capable of supporting self-sufficiency alongside their taxation of international trade. We'll look at the economy in more detail in an upcoming episode. One of the best known things about the Khazars is that the ruling family 
although it's not clear how much of the population beyond them, appears to have converted to Judaism. Almost every aspect of the conversion, from whether it happened, when it happened, to who caused the conversion and who actually converted, is in dispute and subject to various legends. We'll have a separate episode on this subject too. While the subjugation of the steppe was in progress, the Khazars faced a bigger challenge from the south. As noted, the Romans and Persians had near ruined themselves fighting each other, leaving them vulnerable to the rising tide of Islam, which was sweeping all before it. Muhammad had died in 632, and the Umayyad Caliphate was now ruling. The Caliphate was highly expansionary and divided the world into Dar al-Islam, the House of Islam, the civilized world that it was their duty to protect, and Dar al-Harb, the House of War, the enemies of Islam. Naturally, the pagan nomads of the steppe fell into this category. The Caliphate also assimilated knowledge and attitudes from the peoples it conquered, and so they took on the idea of Gog and Magog, tribes who would be fighting on the side of evil at the Apocalypse, and saw themselves as taking over the imperial role of the Sassanids, and to a lesser degree Byzantium, which were in opposition to the steppe. As we have already seen, the Christians of the Eastern Empire tended to identify whichever the currently dominant steppe power was with Gog and Magog. Being highly expansionary, and with the momentum of a few decades of very successful campaigning, the Muslims were thinking about conquest and direct control, rather than the Persian and Byzantine methods of alliances, buffers and buying off threats. The resulting wars placed the existence of the Khazar Khayyanat under threat and continued for around a century. The Khazars survived in part precisely because the Khayyanat was a steppe empire. Although the Arabs tried to take Balanjar and Samandar, two cities they identified as the Khayyanat's capital, we don't know where exactly they were, they may have been summer and winter capitals, the Khazars were not centralised even to the extent they would be around their later capital, Hatil. Instead, they disregarded the loss of towns and followed the traditional step pattern of manoeuvres, feints and retreats. So the Muslims were unable to deliver a killer blow to decapitate the state and achieve their surrender. The Arabs reached Armenia in 640, and a couple of years later, the first moves into the Caucasus were led by Abd al-Rahman ibn Rabiah. They reached Durbant, which controlled one of the routes north through the Caspian and had returned to Persian control, where the governor surrendered in exchange for not having to pay the jizya tax on unbelievers. Al-Tabari, the Islamic Golden Age historian, claims that they continued into Hazaria and reached Balanjar without losses, but this is not supported by modern scholarship. The Arabs spent a decade entrenching their authority in Armenia and Transcaucasia. In 645, they defeated a Byzantine army with a Khazar cavalry contingent. In 652, the Armenians accepted the Caliphate as overlords, followed by Iberia, that's Georgia, not Spain, in 654. The first large-scale incursion was an attack on Balanjar in 652. Khazar reinforcements arrived in time to lift a brief siege and routed the Arabs with losses of 4,000 dead, including Abd al-Rahman. The Arabs returned for revenge in 655, but were once again defeated. Despite their victories, the Khazars decided to abandon Balanjar which was somewhere in modern Dagestan, and moved their capital north to Atil on the Volga. Long term, this would turn out to be a great move, as taxing the Volga river trade would be extremely lucrative. For the rest of the 7th century, things remained relatively quiet. 
the Islamic world was experiencing its first civil war over the succession to the caliphate, while Byzantium worked to foment rebellion, or at least resistance, in the Transcaucasus. For their part, the Khazars were consolidating their control of the western steppe and the southern Volga, so they had little interest in hostilities to the south. There were occasional raids into the Transcaucasus, but only for plunder and slaves, not for conquest. They may have attempted to bring Caucasian Albania under their control, acting through the North Caucasian Hun. The Huns raided Albania in 664, resulting in the daughter of the Hun king marrying the prince of Albania. There was another campaign in 685, when the Arabs tried to bring the prince back into their sphere of influence. But by the 8th century, the Arabs were tightening control over their Caucasian possessions. A revolt in Armenia was crushed in 705, local autonomy was abolished, and it became a province under direct Arab rule. Bringing the borders of the Caliphate and the Kayanat right up to each other. The Second Arab Khazar War began as a small scale conflict. The Arabs aimed to take Durband and establish control over the pass. Attacks in 707, 708, and 709 failed to dent the Khazar defense, but in 713 or 714, the Arabs were finally successful. Led by Maslama, the Arabs then moved against the Khazars' Hun vassals. He was opposed by the Khazars led by Alp, which means hero, and the Khazars also raided Albania and Azerbaijan. The battles were inconclusive, and the war went nowhere for a few years. In 721, the Khazars decided to escalate. Gathering a force of 30,000, they broke into Armenia and destroyed the army of the local governor inflicting major defeats on the Arabs in February and March 722. The Caliph, Yazid II, responded by dispatching 25,000 Syrian troops, led by al-Jarrah ibn Abdullah, to meet them. Although the Khazars retreated towards Derbent, al-Jarrah was able to go around them and reach the citadel without opposition. Arab raiding parties pushed the Khazars back, and the two armies met in force a day north of Derbent. Although the Khazars had been reinforced at up to 40,000 strong, the Arabs won and continued to drive north. The towns of Khamzin and Tarhu were taken and depopulated. At Balanjar, the Khazars set up a wagon lager surrounding the city, but on 21st August, the Arabs broke through. The population was taken into slavery or slaughtered, including by mass drownings, and the city looted. According to Arab historians, there was so much plunder in the city that each of the 30,000 soldiers in the Arab army received 300 gold dinars. The Arabs proceeded to destroy a few more forts, but were compelled to return, seeking additional troops. Arab historians kind of gloss over what's happening to try to pass this off as a successful campaign, but the situation here is likely the age-old problem for sedentary empires invading the steppe. Although the Arabs had taken the former capital, they had not defeated the main Khazar army, which, as always, was quite independent of the cities and took care of its own supplies. As the Arabs extended their own lines, they became vulnerable to raiding in the rear and risked getting cut off, while the loss of a few towns or fortresses made little difference to the Khazars' fighting ability. In 723, the Arabs returned with a new campaign that once again achieved little, and then in early 20, 724, it was the Khazars' turn. In February, a Khazar raiding force met al Jarrah between the Kura and Aras rivers in a battle that ran over several days and resulted in a comprehensive defeat for the Khazars. Perhaps concerned by the lack of progress in Arab attempts to move northwards, as well as by continuing Khazar raids into their provinces, in 725 the Caliph replaced al Jarrah with his brother Maslama, one of the leading generals of the Umayyads. 
For the time being, little changed. Maslama was preoccupied with the Byzantines and delegated the Khazar front to his general Al-Harith. He attempted to strengthen Arab control over Caucasian Albania, but in 726 the Khazars invaded Albania and Azerbaijan in force, in a move that showed that they were able to call on useful resources among their vassals to complement their cavalry forces. The Khazars brought mangonels, or traction trebuchets, to lay siege to Warthan. Although al Harith succeeded in pushing them back across the Arras, the Khazars started to look like they had the upper hand. The conflict escalated further. Maslama took personal control of the army, and on the other side, the Kayan arrived to join the campaign for the first time. Maslama went on the offensive, retaking Dariel Pass and attempting to drive into Khazar territory before being forced to retreat by the winter. In 728, he made a new attempt. The Arab histories give a somewhat confused picture of the campaign. The weather was apparently terrible. The Arabs marched and fought in the mud under 40 days of continuous rain before claiming that they defeated the Qayyum on 17 September. Whether they really managed to score much of a victory, though, has to be open to question, as shortly after, on their way home, they were ambushed by the Khazars and forced to flee for their lives, dragging their baggage train behind them. The failure resulted in Maslama, who had managed to achieve less than nothing of note, being swapped back for al Jarrah. Arab control of the Transcaucasus was increasingly shaky, and in 729, the Khazars invaded Azerbaijan once again. The war turned into a series of counter-strikes. Khazars raided Azerbaijan, the Arabs hit Tbilisi and the Daryal Pass, and penetrated deep into Khazar territory, but were then forced to pull back as the Khazars attacked Albania. Bypassing al Jarrah and his army by taking the Caspian Gates, the Khazars invested Ardabil, Azerbaijan's capital, a city of around 30,000. Al-Jarakh made his troops undertake a forced march to try and catch the Khazar army while it was in place. Reaching the city in early December, battle commenced on the 7th and lasted until the 9th. The result was a total Khazar victory. Al-Jarakh himself lay dead, alongside almost all the 25,000 soldiers of his army. The city was sacked, its population taken into slavery, and Khazar bands raided deep into Muslim heartlands, reaching as far as Mosul. This defeat did not go down well in Baghdad. For the first time, an enemy had entered the Caliphate. As far as the Khazars went, they were most likely just following the normal step strategy against sedentary empires, punitive raids resulting in tribute and trade rights. So when the Arabs, who weren't in any mood to pay them off, brought new forces north for revenge, they found that the Khazars were mostly gone or on their way back home, and they won only a few small inconclusive battles. Now Maslama was back in charge, and probably looking for a major victory to restore his personal prestige after the last time round, beginning with harsh public punishments for locals who had been taking advantage of the opportunity to recover their independence. He soon restored Muslim control over Albania and then marched north. The garrison left at Durban was too small to impede his army, and so he just went straight past them. Once again, he was successful against the towns, but was forced to retreat when he encountered the main Khazar force, using the old light a load of campfires and then sneak off in the night trick. The Khazars followed him south until the Arabs met up with reinforcements and then after a brief skirmish, it was the Khazars' turn to withdraw. Maslama seized the opportunity to take Durban, forcing the defenders out by poisoning the water supply, and then moved in a strong garrison of 25,000 Syrians. But that was his only real success. The rest of the army returned south, the Khazars recovered their towns, and little had changed. The dissatisfied caliph replaced Maslama with Marwan ibn Muhammad, the man who would become the last Umayyad Caliph.
a decade later. It's not clear what, if anything, happened over the next year. The Arab sources do describe Marwan campaigning in the north, but the description seems to be the same as for the previous year's expedition. Maybe it all went down the same way as the time before, or maybe the historians just mixed up the years. In the south, Marwan struck a deal with Armenia, restoring some of its autonomy in return for the supply of soldiers, which might show that the Arabs were having trouble replenishing their armies. In a further sign of exhaustion, the Arabs did not campaign in either the Caucasus or Transoxiana, where they had been doing badly against other Turkic tribes, for the next two years. Marwan was not happy with the state of affairs in the Caucasus. Decades of fighting had achieved nothing. The Khazars had raided the Caliphate's heartland. He believed he knew what needed to be done, and he asked the Caliph to give him 120,000 men and the task of solving the Khazar problem. Despite this, when he returned to the Caucasus in 735, Marwan was not able to launch any major expeditions. Instead, he reinforced the Arab position in Iberia and Albania with campaigns against local princes. According to Orthodox patriarch and Syriac language historian Michael the Syrian, the Arabs and Khazars even concluded a peace treaty at this time, although Arab sources claim this was a ruse to buy time. In 737, Marwan went to Baghdad again to beg the Caliph for enough men to solve the Khazar problem. This time, the Caliph was ready to listen and provided an army claimed to number 150,000, consisting of regular Syrian and Jazeera troops, with Armenian support and volunteer fighters. Whatever the actual number, it was by far the largest force that the Arabs had assembled against the Khazars. First, Marwan made sure that there would be no problems with anti-Arab Armenian factions. Then he turned his attention to the remaining part of Iberia. The Iberian ruling family fled to Anacopia, a fortress in Abkhazia, which was under Byzantine protection. The Arabs attempted to lay siege, but an outbreak of dysentery put paid to that idea. Turning north, Marwan split his army and launched the invasion of Hazaria. 30,000 men were sent with the governor of Derbent along the Caspian Sea coastal route, while the remainder led by Marwan crossed the Dariel Pass. Marwan had held the Khazar envoy to the Arabs captive, so the Qayyan had no warning of their advance, and they reached and rejoined forces at Samandar without opposition. From there, the Arabs advanced on the Khazar capital, al Baida on the Volga. Once again, this did not in itself achieve anything of strategic value. Even two centuries later, Ar Arab travellers would describe the capital as largely an encampment. It was never built up into a city as such. The Khazars left a defensive force and retreated into the steppe. Only one Arab source, Ibn Athan, author of the Book of Conquests, describes what happened after that. Marwan continued north and attacked the Burtas, Slavic vassals of the Khazars living between Khazaria and Volga, Bulgaria, taking tens of thousands captive. The Khazar army watched the Arab advance from the other shore of the Volga, but declined to enter battle. Marwan split his army again and sent 40,000 men across the Volga to make a surprise attack on the Khazars. They caught a Khazar army in swampy territory, which must have limited their cavalry, and killed and captured thousands. The Qayyan responded with a request for peace, and Marwan offered Islam or the sword. The Qayyan agreed to convert, and Marwan assigned two clerics to instruct him in the avoidance of wine, pork, and unclean meats. Taking 20,000 Slavs as slaves, the Arabs withdrew to eastern Georgia, where the Slavs revolted and were killed. The Arab Khazar Wars were over, but had the Arabs actually achieved anything? No. 
Although the Arabs did manage to establish control over Durban, they never had any chance of subduing the Khazars. And although the Arabs had successfully brought much of the Caucasus under their control, the wars established the frontier of Muslim conquest at the border with the Khazar Karyana. Much as the Franks had at the Pyrenees in the west blocked Islam from entering northern Europe, so the Khazars blocked Islam entering Europe from the east. This alone would make them worthy of a significant spot in this podcast. The supposed conversion of the Kayan possibly never took place, and if it did, it did not last long, and there is no trace of it. The Kayans appear to have converted to Judaism by 740, with distinguishing themselves from the Muslim Arabs and Byzantine Christians, often given as one of the reasons for the conversion. If anything, the vast expenditure of blood and treasure in the Caucasus for little gain, combined with the necessity of maintaining a large force at Durban, added to the overextension of the Arab armies and contributed to the fall of the Umayyad Caliphate. Periodically, both Arabs and Khazars made raids into each other's territory, but these were small scale and they never went to war with each other again. Instead, the Arabs joined the healthy trade through Khazaria, and thanks to this, troves of Arab coin can be found across Northern Europe. Join me next time for a look at the Khazar economy. Where did they get the riches that made their empire stable enough to endure for centuries, and what helped bring it down? Each episode has an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss, and sources. You can find them through the link in the show notes or on the website at www.therussianempirehistorypodcast.com. You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter, or Facebook, or email to hello at therussianempirehistorypodcast.com. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye.